Go Radio 5.1 live from the Bow Store on Main Street. I am Brian Cook. Seth Fisher right here. <laughs> we have a special guest. Say hi. Greg Dooley. MVictors.com. <laughs> What's going on? We're just going to say our names and then it's going to be dead air for the next 90 minutes. You can <laughs> tell that wasn't rehearsed. That was the plan, actually. You said you weren't going to be here for half an hour, well, so I, I went and got Dooley. I knew I was going to uh, cut it close. I had a very important meeting. Yeah. For, for Ann Arbor politics? Uh, <laughs> actually, yes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you jumping in the game? No, 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 not myself. I'm I'm an organizer. Ah. But uh, but maybe you should do the uh, the sponsors so that I'm glad I'm glad you're yeah, here to remind me. Otherwise, idea. I totally would have forgotten. Uh, we are uh, at the Bow Store. Obviously, we are sponsored by Bow Store and Underground Printing. Also, Home Sure Lending, the Residence Inn, Ann Arbor Downtown, University of Michigan Alumni Association, Peak Wealth Management, Human Element, Michigan Law Grad, the Phil Klein Insurance Group, Fuego Box, Ann Arbor Elder Law, and Perrin Brewing. So uh, we are going to get to Army and uh, our last kind of takes on the Middle Tennessee game. But we do have Greg here for uh, what was going to be a fascinating uh, segment without me, which I don't even remember what it was about. What was it about? Well, y- you said you weren't going to be here so right. I could talk about whatever I wanted to. Uh, and I'm a Michigan guy, so what I want to talk about is, you know, World War II history. Okay. <laughs> so it's <I> mean, <laughs> 1945 then? Yeah. I mean, we're playing Army. It's, uh, it's appropriate. I, uh, most people probably have heard about what happened in 45, but... A, uh, like, do you mean the dropping of the atomic bomb? Well, there was that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but f- but something happened in football that was even bigger, this, Brian. This took on a completely different <laughs> field than the Dooley <laughs> Fisher show. I, I yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know You're going to come and bring your Ann Arbor politics here. Hey, I, you guys brought it up. I haven't said anything. I, uh, <laughs> Where's the beer? <laughs> I don't actually know what happened in 1945, so why don't you inform me? Uh, we had a uh, Fritz Chrysler. Actually, I, I w- here's how I wanted to start it. Dooley, you, uh, you keep on your website, M. Victor's, yeah. a, uh, a uniform timeline. Oh, I do. And I th- wanted to get your take on the uh, changes to the helmet this year. Sure. I really like them. Yeah. Um, so what you've got going on in the helmet is a, a broader face to the, the maze portion, the wing, right, right. The, the front end. And it's more prominent, and as the wing goes around the helmet, it hooks up more and makes more of a hook on right. the end of it. And if you look at even old T-shirts, we're in the bow store, old T-shirts, old photos, um, especially from the 70s, that was really the style. The, the front end was a little more, and I think, menacing. You saw that maze more. Over the years, the whole thing somehow, just over the years, kind of flattened out, and the, the wings kind of became points on the side. And um, I like it. I, I, well, what, and what do you guys think? I, I think they got the stripes right, finally. Cause yeah, that's right. And the stripes converge in the back right. kind of nicely above, you know, um, you know. Right. Yeah. Above the back of the head. Instead yeah. of, and it leaves more space for the, uh, the helmet stickers. Cause so this yeah. is the thing that happened in 1945 that everybody already knows? Well, no. but We took a, we took yeah. a, a little yeah. dive there to yeah. the side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I, I wanted your opinion. Well, I'll but Chrysler did. We, we have yeah. a tie back there. Chrysler yeah. did uh, introduce that style helmet. So. Exactly. So Chrysler brought us the, the winged helmets, and Chrysler also invent a lo- um, invented platoon football yeah. in 1945. So this yep. is how w- this is how we d- we're bringing it in. We're talking about okay. like wartime, and Michigan, like a lot of schools, was having a hard time fielding a team because anytime you have someone you know athletic and healthy enough to play football, the army takes them and you know throws them against the Nazis. Or 
that was i mean <laughs> i they, get i get it right yeah. <laughs> which is, right. i mean if <laughs> wait which teams you know <laughs> wait a minute yeah well, right I, well as, sometimes they, they weren't always throwing them against the nazis sometimes they were going to this you is know, right this Pacific is like the era where michigan was like playing teams like iowa pre-flight right yes so yep iowa pre-flight must have just been a bunch of kids who played college football who got drafted and yep that's Great crazy. Lakes. Great Lakes was a military right. institution uh, near Chicago or whatever and had a football team and played those guys. Yeah, so there was a bunch of that going on. And most of the rosters at the time were filled with guys that were effectively moving around in these programs. There was a program called the V-12 program, which the Army kind of sanctioned. It said, we're training all these officers at West Point. We need more officers, so let's have the colleges help us train these men to be leaders in the Army. Um and, and they just so happen to take, like, you know, all the All-Americans from all over the country. And be like, sure, yeah. No, we're going to take your Devin Bush, and we're going to take your, yeah. It was bigger. It was, it was a big deal. Actually, the colleges, as I understand it, um, and this is, this is my understanding from Fritz Chrysler's perspective, the colleges actually said, this probably doesn't make sense to play football during this time. And the Army came back, and the military came back and said, no, actually – we see a lot of benefit here in continuing these athletic programs because they're going to train, they're going to continue to keep these men in, in shape. And we I have Doc Blanchard. Well, <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's Glenn Davis going. But they said, you know, hey, we, we should keep these guys fit. Um, a lot of them were training in these programs and moving around. And, um, you know, a good football program is a good – and ath athletics in general are a good way to sustain that. So – um, so yeah, college yeah. football continued. It, it there was not a for everybody though. It. A lot of a lot of programs shut down for the war. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's an interesting point, which I think we'll get to. But what happened in that forty-five game? Um, it had some really positive effects, I think, and some interesting effects. Uh, later on, it had um, it changed the game. Um, that suddenly, when you did this, it changed what the teams looked like. Right. We'll, we'll get to that. Right. We'll get to that. Like well, so like just to. Put, put us so in like Michigan at wartime. You're, you're talking about the 1945 Michigan Army game. Yes, specifically. Yes, okay. Yeah, at yeah. Yankee Stadium, and uh, we'd probably back up a little bit, yeah. right? Because um, so they once they decided to play football, and so this is this is Fritz Chrysler. He came in 1938 uh, from Princeton, brought the winged helmet. You know, effectively started a new era of Michigan football. To me, the era right before that was kind of the end of the Yost era. Harry Kipke got fired. Um, in 1937, um, had scandals going on, was paying players, had a slush fund. Most importantly, he was losing to Ohio State, Minnesota, everybody. Okay, <laughs> bad. And he got let go. And earlier he had won some national championships, so it wasn't like he was a complete flop. Chrysler comes in and um, rebuilds the program. He keeps Tom Harmon, um, and they start to win some games. War breaks out. They decide, hey, well, as I just said, we're going to play football. He is on the rules committee. He's a very respected guy. They talk about, in 1941, some rule changes here. If we're going to play, we need some subtle rule changes. And at the time, if you were injured, you could leave the game, or you could leave the, the game and be substituted one player at a time, but you couldn't come back in the quarter. You couldn't return to the game. So, and you didn't have these units of people. Um, teams, teams fielded small teams because you could play your best 11 guys and you had very few substitutions, right, that right. were allowed. And you wanted to save those substitutions in case someone got hurt in fourth quarter, you know, how you would play it. So they allowed that rule to say in 1941, they changed the rule very subtly to say you could substitute at any time. But no one really took advantage of it until 1945, the Army game. Right. They're going against Army who has great football players during World War II, right. <laughs> the frickin' Army. Right, well, they've got, <laughs> they've got two, uh, two recruiting ideas that they can use that no one else has really tried before. One was we can draft any player we want to. <laughs> <laughs> and two, we can promise any high school player you don't have to go and fight in the war. You can just go play football for us for, 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 for the next year or right. whatever. Right, right. Yeah. And, and Michigan was getting really clever, too. Michigan turned West Quad into, quote, the ship. So they had, like... Are they, every time there was any sort of training program, like let's teach guys how to speak Japanese, Michigan's like, oh, we'll take it. All right, let's let's do an engineering program. Michigan's like, oh, we'll take them. And so like they have all these military programs at University of Michigan, and they're getting guys who are draftees from like Wisconsin, like Crazy Lake yep. Hirsch comes from that, right? So Traitor. Yeah, so we're <laughs> we're getting <laughs> <laughs> like two people got that bird yeah. right there. <laughs> 
<laughs> Somewhere Dr. Sapp is like, yes! <laughs> Dude, we got him! <laughs> Do you get that one, Ryan? No. He voted against Michigan For the in the 73 yeah, vote. I see. I see. 6-4. Any, Craig knows. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, Michigan Michigan take, took advantage of this, too. They got a whole bunch of guys from other teams, like Wisconsin yeah. star running back, uh, Crazy Legs Hirsch, and like, put them in, the, uh, in these training programs that they played for a bit. But by 44, the NCAA allows freshmen to play. And that kind of changes things for Michigan because they were struggling afterwards to try to field guys because everyone's going across the seas. Mm-hmm. And so the 44 freshmen are now like sophomores in 45. And that's all they have. And these guys are not like your normal freshmen because they're looking for guys who are like 16 years old when they graduate high school because then you get two years out of them before they get drafted, right? Like yep. as, soon as, they're, as soon as they're 18, some guys, like the day they're 18, it could be like the day before the game. Okay, you're gone. Yep. So. Yeah, and or you're gone or you're moved around to another um, area of the United States to train or right. whatever, right? Right. And another, you mentioned 44 – um, because of that V12 program, they had requirements about how far and how long they could travel off base, base right. being Ann Arbor. And what it led to was our game against Marquette in 1944 was a night game because it, the only way they could meet, play the game and get the students back was to actually travel there, play the game, and quickly get back and get on the trains back. It was like a 48- or 72-hour rule. They played the game at night. It's Michigan's first night game. They actually played with a maze football or a yellow football so they could <laughs> see it better. You, there's pictures of it. You can see it. Did they have lights? Uh, um, I believe they had lights. I believe they had some kind of lights. But it was. But the, the pictures look at the, – it's very dark. It's almost like the flash effect right. you know, when you see that. So uh, that was 1944 against Marquette. Yeah. So they got that going on. All right. So we get to 45. Michigan is still fielding a bunch of 17-year-olds. And – the uh, they're they're scheduled to play Army at Yankee Stadium. Now Michigan's considered a pretty good team, but Army Ranked. is like romping everybody. Yep. And this is like Michigan's opportunity to be like the service academy because they go in there and keep it really close. And they were not supposed to be competitive at all. The only team that was supposed to be at all competitive was Navy, and even they weren't. Right. Right. Uh, but Michigan keeps this game seven seven. I think until the fourth quarter or the end of the third. They played them tight. I forget yeah. the exact circumstances. Um, it was one of those games yeah. that if you're the favorite, you're not very happy about the the score for most of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think Blanchard scored, you know, put it put it away at the end. And right. Yeah, scored a couple touchdowns. Right. It ends up like 28-7, but right. I think it was close most of the game. So, yeah, and so um, the story goes is that, you know, Chrysler was a smart guy, and he, he, he knew about the rule change because he's the rules guy. And even though it was 1941, <laughs> no one had really tried it. And he goes, all right we're going to have some units here. And he actually starts platooning, substituting teams of players. You guys go in here. You guys go in there. And it actually, for a, for a non-Twitter internet, you know, papers are out the next day, um, the media coverage of the game and later the, ni- the uh, 1946 game in Ann Arbor, but it got so much attention that w- it spread word of mouth right. all over the coaching ranks that even some teams heard about it. The radio announcers didn't know what was going on, um, didn't get flagged for it or fined for it. Must have talk, I'm sure he talked to the refs. He goes, yeah. hey, man, there's this rule. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and it really caught on. And, you know, he's, he's credited for pioneering that, that, whole, that whole technique and strategy, which, of course, we, we know. Yeah, I mean, the idea was that all week they could practice just defense was practicing stopping the offense and the offense could – and being able to use players that they usually just kept on the bench. Like, if you – are a good passer and you can't play linebacker or safety, like they can hide one or two guys on the defense, but that's it. Yeah. So like the ability to kind of specialize like that was revolutionary. It made Michigan a much better team. They still got their butts whipped by Army, but it was a um, – it changed the game because now a guy like Tom Brady could play it. I'd be fascinated yeah. to see what would happen if they went back to the old rule. So <laughs> they actually did. In 1953. Really? Yes, led by um, General Neyland from Tennessee. <laughs> he, he championed going back because here's the problem. The war ends. You have some prosperity. All these guys come home. But the football teams now are specialized. So instead of, you know, having these, ge- these teams where the team picture is, you know, the staff of Engel blog. Right. It's, uh, you know, now there's, there's you know. 30 guys, 50 guys, 60 guys in the football team, smaller schools, 
um, can't afford to have these big football teams and train all these men. So they're like, well, we're out. Or they're, they're saying, we're going to get out. Um, dozens of teams, as I understand it, around that time started saying, this is too much. So they went back peri- for a small period to the old rule. Um, and, you know, you can you can understand that, right? I how, bet you it would be yeah. controversial. How long did they go back? To I that? believe to the 60s, to the early 60s. They yeah, so they, back. eight years it was back to single. Yeah, to something people. like that. Yeah, we looked this up when we were doing, when Sapp and I were doing the 64 podcast because they had – it kept on. They they made the rule, and then an, all the big teams hated it, and so they it, it slowly to changed. Peel it back. Right, so yeah. they pe- peeled it back until the point where it was getting stupid because everyone was substituting, but then everyone had to check in, and yeah. like, there were a number of checks you could go in so many times. So then teams were trying to like army games away so you could actually get your defense and offense in because you right. only had eight ch- chances to go in. Finally, they gave up, and I think by '62 it was uh, it was a free for all again. Yeah, and I, and I know I know there it was still restrictive though in the '60s, right? Because I've yeah. I've talked to these guys where there's a turnover and they can't get off the field, right? Well, there um, wasn't a TV timeout or something like that. Yeah, that yeah. would be amazing. It would be kind of cool. It, it, I mean, I think a team should try that. Like, just teach yeah. your defense. Like, yeah. if no. you get a turnover, just line up real quick. That and would be. It's <laughs> that would yeah. be. There's there's like whole rules preventing that from happening now. Right. But I I would. <laughs> Like, FCS should just do that. Just, like, no more substitutions. If you have a 350-pound guy, he's got to play both ways. That'd be awesome. But it'll never happen because people get tired. That's what I think. Hmm. Well, it, I, I, if you watched a lot of the video from back then, the football was not nearly as good. So no, I, I like think we're okay with – Haven't <laughs> Haven't we gotten to the point where we know that good football is not necessarily good football? <laughs> We just, I mean, there was just an NFL game on, right, where everybody's extremely competent and the uh, final score was 7-3. to three. Give me 62-60 to 60 because you're playing a 350 guy in literally every snap of the game. It's not what's mm. going to happen. You're not going to have someone who could pass anymore because the guy's got to play linebacker, That's too. That's fine. It's fine. Well, no, It'll you're going to end up. It'll make the UFR a little more interesting, too. Well, well yeah. <laughs> watch tomorrow's <laughs> game. And then come back and tell me if you want to go back to, like, the style th- where everyone I runs do. for three yards and then waits 40 seconds and then yeah. runs three yards again. And uh, it's, it, it's fine. It'll, it'll work. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. So here's another story that I picked up looking at this. Um, there's a great article about Fritz Kreisler in Sports Illustrated in the 60s. And um, so he used to get this. He used to plop. He used to plant a spotter and a guy with a bugle on top of the, pr- the Michigan press box. Um, why teams used to play run the old play where you hide, you disguise your 11th guy in the huddle or on the sideline and run right. up, call it the sleeper play. <laughs> They'd have a guy dedicated to watching the other team's sideline. And as soon as they saw, they, they counted the men, they saw the 11th guy or whatever, uh-huh. he would blast the bugle from top <laughs> of the Michigan. So I, of course I go on to the Bentley website and I'm looking for old pictures of the press box. It's on M Victors right now. Um, there are two guys on top of the press box in the middle, and clearly one guy is hunched <laughs> over, what looks like he had in the binoculars uh, position, looking down um, toward the north, you know, right. east sideline, <laughs> which, you know, you can't see who's in the field. And there's another guy next to him, you know, and I can't, I can't see the bugle. <laughs> I can't make out the bugle, but I thought it was great. It was pretty clear what I they're thought up it was to. Great. Yeah. yeah, and he says, yeah. Uh, he goes, yeah, but we, d- we didn't travel with the guy, and Zupke got us, you know, in the Illinois <laughs> game, you know. So I thought that was great. There was a clip that Sap got recently about Chrysler and his rules. You know, he was on the rules committee for years and years. So at one point they think, okay, there's not enough scoring, so let's try to increase field goals. So they told him, go and look at the width of the of yep. the field. So they did, and they went and did some testing, and they came back, and they said, okay, here's how wide it should be. And then they, went, they made that rule, and then they tried to promulgate it, and all of a sudden the guys who made the field goal posts, which were, I guess, wood back then, uh, they, got, they said, we can't ship a piece of wood that length. It's going to bend. <laughs> so they, <Dude. laughs> they scaled it back. And the, to what they <laughs> I love it. They scaled it back to like the maximum level that whatever this wood company was could, could cut it at. And that today is the, the width of the field goals. That's great. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, that's – so that's um, – they were talking in the, in the early part of the last century about the rule changes. And they're talking about width of the field and length of the field. 
And Harvard said, hey, slow down, guys. We just built a concrete stadium, <laughs> and we can't go that far. We can't go that wide. Um, let's, let's maybe do the passing rule that you guys were talking about. It said they were going to lengthen the field and widen it so it was a little more open. It wasn't uh-huh. such a rugby slugfest. And Harvard was like, slow down. <laughs> Brand new concrete stadium. <laughs> not you know, not modular. Right. Didn't build it modular. <laughs> so slow down. We're Harvard. Harvard. You know, which is a great little note. Um, but Chrysler's great. And – I'll tell you, I, I do encourage anyone who likes this stuff, go check out this 1960 SI article in the vault. Easy to, easy to find. The Man Who Changed Football. And it talks about all this stuff. But it really emphasizes how much stag meant to him. So he, Fritz Kreisler was a Chicago guy. He, he literally tells a story how he bumped into Stag at a practice when he was a freshman. And Stag looked at him and said, why aren't you playing football? Stag gave him his nickname. It was actually a burn on him because there was a famous violinist named Fritz Chrysler. Chrysler had fumbled a bunch of balls, and he was basically mocking him, calling him, you know, <laughs> it's like, you're, you're a real artist. But right. no, it was actually the other way. Like, he was respecting the real Fritz Chrysler. Right. You are no Fritz Chrysler. <laughs> you're Fritz Chrysler. You know, like, tiny. Hey, tiny. Right. So he, he loved the man, and in his office he had pictures of the guy, and they get into the one in the stadium attendance with right. him. And oh, are you going to tell me it's stag he, seat? He doesn't come out and say it. He he says I know. He basically says I know all about it, and I know where it is, or whatever you know, and, and whether that's a real thing or not. But the the author at the very conclusion goes, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this is for Stag, basically, <laughs> and it's it is very very defensible that this is for Stag. So, did so Chrysler- which is a mean burn on Michigan people. So especially given that this championship trophy is named after a man who hasn't coached in a long time, which is one thing, whose team, though, hasn't played football since 1939, who isn't even in our conference anymore. And who wasn't like <laughs> – and, and wasn't as good of a boy as he always portrayed himself Absolutely either. Absolutely not, which we get into. And yeah, we got in the, in the Hill in of Victors article. the Victors here. article, yeah. Yeah, but at least it's not Paterno. <laughs> True. Yes, much <laughs> better. Much yeah. better. I think I think you, you have a good case, though. For it at least should be the, the Stag Yost trophy, but that's, that's maybe a Did, another uh, topic. Did Chrysler? I think it should be the Chrysler Trophy. Did uh, did Chry- did Fritz get along with uh, with Yost, or what was that so relationship like? So I think that's a so that just just so everyone's clear, you know, th- this was not Yost's guy. Like right. Yost's power, um, effectively, see, with with the kind of the crash of Harry Kipke, a lot of it kind of started in 1934. Willis Ward game mm-hmm. g- season's an absolute mess. I you know, maintains worse than anything we've seen, worse than Rich Rod. I, you know, used to get a laugh. And now I remember, like, <laughs> you know. Um, that got a laugh? It used to get a <laughs> laugh. Well, when when it was like Rich Rod was fresh, it was, oh, oh yeah, that uh, guy. I remember, you know, well, you know Rich Rod. <laughs> now, yeah. Thank God we got Brady Hoke. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, Hoke. <laughs> Sugar Bowl, baby, with Brendan Gibbons. God, he didn't play. <laughs> you know. Oh, he did. He Yo, did. he sure did. He did. Yep. He that sure was did. the year before. He sure did. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, used to get a little bit of a chuckle. But, it, so, th- that that whole thing fell. Uh, Yost wanted somebody else. And his power was fading. And, effectively, when Chrysler took, took command, part of his deal was he'd, he would be taking over the reins for right. Yost. So, it really made Yost a lame duck athletic director. Yost dies in 46. I think he retired a couple years before that. Chrysler takes over. Did they get along? I think they got along fine. Um, I don't know that they had cocktails together. In fact, I don't think Yost drank, but, um, you know, I think they got along just fine. But there, there was, it was no love affair. So I will say that, this notion that this thing was for Yost, right. I think we would have known. If the seat was for Yost, I think we would have, Chrysler would have said that. Now, we built Chrysler Arena. It's named after Chrysler when he was alive. So, right. the, so obviously, while the man was didn't seem to be a braggart or anything, he went ahead and said, "Yeah, sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it Chrysler Arena." Um, so, anyway. it just it, it seems like to that point, Yost would have been the the guy at Michigan, and might have kind of felt like Michigan was his program, mm-hmm. the way that kind of Paterno felt like Penn State was his program, mm-hmm. and the idea of someone coming in with a very different culture, and you know, a stag guy of all things, right? Yeah. Like it would, I I bet that would be the kind of thing that Yost would not have been. Absolutely <laughs> not. About. Yeah, and we're and I we skipped over Yost rivalry with Stag, which is incredibly right. well <laughs> documented in John Crick's book, um, which you have to read. Um, but 
yeah, they, they, they had wicked battles. Now, their, even their rivalry eased off a little bit in the end, and they kind of came became the two old men of Western right, football. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, even in this Sports Illustrated Stag article. Stag was easier the, to take when he was losing. Yeah, just to be the old man to Stag was not Yost. The old man was was, was Stag to right. Chrysler. <laughs> so just to be clear, in fact, he's the old man, you know. Well, everyone else was calling Yost the old man. He was, But um, if there is someone who deserves to have that seat, designate for him it's yost right no question i, I always learned, did i always that learned happen. this chrysler like you just saved the seat for himself it, it could it certainly could be um the guy who deserves it is yost the guy who probably it's for is chrysler <laughs> um the guy you know who chrysler might have hit right yeah but the, the guy who if i think chrysler had a say in it it would be stacked well, so well if i had a say in it, it would have been denard robinson so that's right maybe yeah. it's whoever perceives the one it's in whatever is in their heart it's funny so i was bacon's books out right which is right. which is great and and uh, i was telling someone though i go you know i don't get into these these kind of behind the scenes with the players that much i don't get into the players backstories that much it's me me yeah. personally he goes oh you didn't like when he followed Dur- Dernard around on campus i'm like you bite your tongue i love that <laughs> you know, of course i like that part the, ba- the Denard backstory that's different he's a different guy okay i'm talking about chase winovich and all these other guys it's not Denard, right so he's oh, an analyst at jacksonville now is he yes no and kidding it's like all right well he could be an analyst here and just walk around making I mean, people he's, happy he's from Dude, florida <laughs> the guy's great yeah. Uh, yeah it's just who doesn't love Denard? matter that's of time yeah, I hope you're right about that. All right, that. well, thank you for uh, coming on. This was a fascinating history lesson. Did you have anything I else that so. you needed to, like, get I mean, off we the sh- old We should, should mention what happened with the 45 yeah. sophomores. Where should I start? Like, oh. when they're oh, seniors. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, Randomly just discussing all sorts of things. No, just like 44 <laughs> is uh, 44 is when they're fresh, allowed to play as freshmen. Mm-hmm. Right. And those same guys are, like, the superstars for 47. And, like, they – that game kind of propels Michigan into the 47-48 back-to-back national championships. All right. So the Mad Magicians aren't – they're not called that yet, but, like, this is that team, and they're sophomores at this Absolutely. Point. Yeah. Yeah, and Army did absolutely win undisputed the cha- national championship yeah. in 1945. We played them again in 46, gave them a tough battle. They beat us. Played them again in 50, lost again in Yankee Stadium. Um, I will I will add one more note about Yankee Stadium. We, Seth, in our article for Hell to the Victors, get into Yost's legacy a little bit. And um, one thing that Notre Dame did when, you know, Rockney and even before they were getting up, they played games in Yankee Stadium and right. they played games in California and Minnesota and Texas. And they went all over the place. And sure, there's the Catholic thing in Notre Dame. It's cool and Rockney's success. But Yost had all that success and more in two different eras. And no one would – put Rockney's name up against Yost. Of course, Yost didn't die in a flaming plane crash at the height of his career, which, which right. added to it. But had – and Yost tried to play some games out there. Had, I think, Yost made more, like, big city trips and played in Yankee Stadium or whatever, polo grounds and things like that, I do think that his name would, would be more renowned, say, in college football history and, and with some of those, those guys on that, whatever they call it, yeah. that Mount Rushmore. All right, so – Is he not? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think he is. No, I don't think you put him up there with, with those type of guys. Even Stag. I think Stag has a has he, a better he name. He doesn't get mentioned until someone's like, Oh, look at his record and you know, when you bring up the uh the point of minute team, someone's like, Oh well that was before they had passing, it doesn't count, you know? I feel like there's a lot I think outside of the, this area there there's a lot of that. That's what I'm talking about. I think if you go to Florida, everybody knows who Newt Rockney is, um Pop Warner. Well, it, when they did that 150-year um, thing on ESPN. Well, Pop yeah. Warner has an advantage. <laughs> a lot, but see, they all have an advantage that that seen. But Yost, e, but Yost did go around the country and speak, so he influenced a lot of people to come to Michigan and talk about it. But all these guys do. And then there were, there were other guys who became famous writers, right, like Pop Warner, but other guys became writers, so their name – they had a lot of advantages. And I, I just think one of the elements of it is this yeah. – didn't play these big games outside that much. And, and if they got a little more – they would have got a little more fan base, I think, in, in the big city. It would have helped his legacy. It was kind of the, the origins of, like, national sports media, when, like, people are going to actually care about games outside of their state and whatnot. And right. Yost didn't get on, in on that. And Chrysler definitely did. He scheduled a game with Notre Dame as soon as he got, came in. And they uh, and then scheduled this thing in New York. And I think Chrysler, had, Chrysler was running a, a modern show by that point. Yep. 
All right. Cool. Well, thank you for coming Thanks, on. dudes. And Victors. Pleasure. All right, guys. And Victors.com. Thanks, fellers. Are we'll you still you. writing for the program? Uh, no, I haven't in a couple oh. years. Um, I'm trying to get them, get this, to have original artwork on the program. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. they pictures of players. Oh, great. Their parents are happy. Right. right. Now, why don't we do something interesting? Why we still have game programs? And so yeah. that's my thing. I've said it for years. Um, so I'm, I'll call it a boycott until we have original artwork. All or right. Not, but <laughs> there it is. All right, guys. See you. <laughs> Let's take a break and come back. We're going to talk about Army. Other stuff. Find while you're out there. When we take the field, we're going to win. We've got big goals. We've got big ideas. We've got to win this game, and there is no game on the remainder of our schedule more important than the one you're going down to the tunnel to play today. Now let's go. Let's go. Underground Printing is proud to present the Bow Store. Visit us at our new location at 333 South Main or online at www.bow.team. It's painless. It's online. It's group ordering made easy for your next custom printed apparel order. Pogo from Underground Printing takes the aggravation out of custom printing for a group. Whether you're selling shirts for a fundraiser, organizing a large event, or trying to collect sizes and payment for a family reunion, Underground Printing is here to help. Save time and hassle every step of the way with our easy-to-use site. No more guessing what to order, chasing people down to pay, or wasting time trying to sort out who needs what. We'll set it up, and you can just sit back and relax. We can even take care of individual shipping. To learn more about Pogo, visit us at any of our convenient locations or at pogo.undergroundshirts.com. Are you planning a business trip, a Michigan reunion, or a revenge tour in Ann Arbor and don't want to be stuck out by I-94? Look no further than the residence in Ann Arbor downtown. Positioned at the corner of Huron and Ashley, the hotel is just a block from Main Street and a short walk to Michigan Stadium and Central Campus with all the amenities you expect. Also, we podcast here most Sunday mornings, so if you let us know you're coming, we'll let you put a shout-out on the pod. That's the residence in Ann Arbor downtown. Here's a thing people say. Seth, tell me about your insurance. I'm <laughs> actually glad you asked me about that because I just changed my insurance and I'm really happy I did. Let me guess. You use Phil Klein and Owen Rosen of the Phil Klein Insurance Group. They are MGO blog readers and they don't advertise during football games. And they've got a five-star rating on anything you would care to see. Call Owen at 248-682-7445 or visit them online at philkleininsurance.com. Recently, Seth and I were having lunch and he asked me, what someone in their 30s married with children should be doing with their finances. I rattled off some gibberish, and then he said, that's what your next ad should be. So here we go. Hey, it's Nick Hopwood, your MGO financial coach. I'm a certified financial planner, founder, and president at Peak Wealth Management. And it would be smart for you to start paying close attention at this point. I think you would want to consider the following. Max out your 401k. I like the Roth 401k as long as your income is under 415000 per year. Max out your Roth IRA. Set up your mortgage on a 15-year amortization. Add 500 a month for each kid's 529. Invest with the appropriate risk tolerance. Make sure you have enough life insurance to cover debts, education, and income replacement. Don't take out any credit card debt. Pay all your bills each month. Make sure you have an emergency fund. And if your needs are any more complicated than that, connect with us at peakwm.com to book an appointment. Peak Wealth Management. Retire with confidence. Welcome back to MGO Radio 5.1 Live from the Bow Store on Main Street. Uh, Greg Dooley has departed from us, but we have added someone who knows as much or more about Michigan history. As no, no, no one knows more than Greg Dooley. But he doesn't know anything <laughs> about promoting himself. It's Craig Ross, everybody. Yeah. How you doing, uh, Craig? Howdy. How do you guys the man say? who lived through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, here's, I did, this is one small story, that in 45, Michigan was a good team, even though they had only one returning starter, in part because a lot of guys ended up in the military. Uh, but they played that year against Great Lakes Naval Base. And you think, well, what's Great Lakes Naval Base? Nothing. And they won that game 27-2. to two. Uh, But uh, Paul Brown was the coach of that team. Of the, of the Naval Base team? Yeah, <laughs> and their best player was Marion Motley. 
And Marion Motley, uh, according to Paul Zimmerman, was the greatest player who ever lived. And according to Otto Graham, who played with both Jim Brown and Marion Motley, uh, was, was, was the greatest player who ever lived. So somehow Michigan beat Marion Motley and Great La Lakes Naval Base in, in 45 uh, and had other good wins, but Navy and Army were obviously, obviously the teams that. All right, well, let's fast forward approximately 60 years to last week against Middle Tennessee. Uh, usually we have a segment where I kind of talk about the things I learned in the upon further review. If you don't want to read 20,000 words, understandable. Uh, so what really jumped out to me is that, you know, Michigan probably could have run an arc read on every play and had the quarterback keep it and scored infinite touchdowns. They just it didn't check it all game. Yeah, I well, there's a lot of theories why he didn't, and the big one was that he got hurt in the first play and didn't want to – they went to, like, you know, end of the season mode – a little bit. Yeah, it's uh, it was a very strange uh, defensive game plan <laughs> from <laughs> Scott Schaefer where, I mean, he blitzed a lot, which I think is a good thing for Michigan because they're going to get blitzed a lot this weekend. And one of the things that really leapt out to me is I don't think there was a single breakdown except the Ruiz issue on the corner out to, to Bell. Right, too right. Long. Everything else was picked up. Nobody got a free pass into the backfield, and that was with, of course, Charbonnet making nine pickups. So I, I think that's a really good sign, so something you can really take from this game because it's not necessarily about, like, the skills of the players involved. It's about your level of organization. Yeah, I, when I read your UFR, I was a little surprised now, partly because I had focused on the offensive tackles for most of the, most of the game. I didn't pay much attention to the quarterback. But you, you gave uh, Patterson a lot of negatives. Yeah. And I wonder if this was more by design than by Patterson's so, choice. you know, I – I, I talked about how you should probably disregard a lot of those, okay. but when I do my grading and I, I have to assume that the read is on. So if the read was on, then there were a lot of opportunities that were scored. If it's not, then it wasn't. But uh, also he, the ball was on the ground four times. So that was a lot of his, his negatives on the ground. I don't think that means much going forward. And I try to, it's, I have to try to strike a balance between like sticking to my system making sure there's some rigor in it, and then having these kind of weird outliers that I have to explain, and that was definitely a weird outlier. I don't think that Shea Patterson had the worst rushing performance in the history of MGO blog. Even though the negatives Even were though right he racked there. But, yeah. like, I, I, just uh, got, like, I have a system, and i got to stick to the system to make it make sense to me personally. So, so you mentioned the arc read. There was a play that both of us clipped, I think, and both of us adored off the arc read where they oh, yeah. they run like an RPO and like the cornerback is supposed to I mean to that's like not an RPO that's just straight up play action cuz the offensive line isn't crossing the line of scrimmage okay but it looks for all the world like an arc read and then the idea is that Collins goes out and throws kind of a crappy stock block and then the cornerback attacks the quarterback and bang you get all of a sudden it's yards. over his head and you get all right. the yards and then the, the cornerback didn't buy it and I was like Come on. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> You'd rather be blocked? Come on. You, yeah. you don't want to make a play right now? You're at Michigan Stadium, man. So I don't know what – if he's a genius or if he was just not paying attention or I don't I know. Thought, I thought – like when I watched the video, I just thought like the block was too good. Like that he was, you know. No, I mean the I, – I don't think he was really or, or that the, full Sorry, effort the block there. wasn't too good. Oh. Yeah. He didn't sell it well enough? Like I think you should try to cut the guy. <laughs> and then he'll get up and he'll be like, "Oh, I I dodged a cut block. Let's go, let's go hit somebody." Right. <laughs> uh, but so that was the sequence where it went that play, which didn't come off. But even though it didn't come off, Michigan still gained five yards on it. So that's a pretty good fail. Yeah, because when you look around, the cornerback's not attacking you. You can just okay, I'll glide down yeah. the field a little bit. And then back-to-back -back RPOs for chunks, and then the Collins post, which removed the safety from the middle of the field with the Eubanks wheel. And was as open as you're going to get on a 30-yard 30 30-yard pass. I mean, that four-play sequence was definitely Gaddis's best of the game, and I just it gives me the good feelings about <laughs> what we're going to see the rest of the season because three of those four plays, you know, that's Michigan attaching dangerous pass concepts to their run defense, which they didn't do at all last year. To, to yeah, their their, their run, run concepts. Yeah. Last year were were great, but they just didn't have anything that passed off of them, except for they think they ran RPOs maybe six times total. Yeah, they had yeah a s half dozen RPOs yeah during the whole season. Right, and these ones make sense. I mean, one of them was off of power, which is one of their base plays. One of them was off of a pin and pull, which is a base one of their base plays or uh, not pin, uh, 
the um, split screen or the split zone, split, split, split zone, zone. one of their base plays. So like, and then building that kind of thing off the arc read too. Like these are Michigan's base running plays, which have been working since Nebraska game last year. And now that they have passed, you saw how hard the on the two RPOs to black, how hard the linebackers came down and the safety came down too. Mm-hmm. They are trained to say, okay, Michigan is running these things. That's how you. That's how you play Michigan. And if those linebackers have to stay back, that opens up so much more for the running game too. Yeah, and it's just a matter of whether you can make the correct reads. And Patterson had a couple of kind of major issues in this game, but making the correct reads on RPOs was not one of them. It's been one of the things that he's been very good at his whole career. Yeah. I think MTSU is not not the best one because they're very blitzy to begin with, and they were – they knew they had to make a choice. They're well, not the ones who can kind of sit back and trust their athleticism to make up for it. Yeah, but also, I mean, think of every game we've had against Northwestern. Right. Where their linebackers are either roaring at the at the ball carrier on a run or, or somehow know, like, I don't know if they're stealing signs or if Michigan has a tell there or were, whatever. There were, there were a lot of rumors last year. That probably just people watching the game and thinking it. But, like, there were a lot of rumors that the I signs mean, got stolen last year. So that's something that you can't continue doing when there's an RPO because it's a post snap read. So if you're playing bis- blitz ball with your linebackers, you're going to get got. And right. Here's, here's what we're running guys. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess we're not playing Northwestern this year, which is unfortunate because they look terrible, but uh, well, they look terrible at the beginning of last year too. And yeah, but and they, they, they looked it around. So last year they had Clayton Thorson who was recovering from an ACL and looked bad. Yeah. And then he got better. He was an established big 10 quarterback. Hunter Johnson looked horrendous and their other pulled, quarterback is hurt and their other quarterback out for, for the, the year. year so right. i i do not forecast a similar outcome for northwestern's 2019 season as they had in 2018 well they were very lucky uh they won yeah. a lot of yeah they were games in overtime half the time so yeah. it's not a not a sustainable division winning champion have you changed your mind of who's coming out of the west now you were i was, was your oh vote? i said minnesota yeah i mean yeah. you know it's 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 up in the air i think that teams that play like really good FCS schools don't get enough credit for it like uh, not San Diego State South Dakota State's a, a, a legit team yeah so you know I, I think the that Jackrabbits. they had some struggles they need to fix some things but they've also got a lot of talent um, it seems like Wisconsin again though doesn't it I, I uh, know that you down you downgraded I, I watched, USF I watched that USF game and so so much of it was just USF being bad horrendous okay. like well, I mean, we'll see how they do in, in week two. Both those, both of those teams. I, I, I have a feeling that USF is not going to be. Who do they have this week? Do I know? don't. I have no idea, I know, but okay. I project them to lose unless they're playing like Colgate, which they might. I don't know. They may be playing Colgate. I, I really don't know USC, USF's. You schedule. don't have that memorized. No, I don't. No, I. There. This was not a great schedule to. This week was not a great week to like no. preview anyway. We should get back to the like last dregs of talking about Middle Tennessee. Yeah. Um, on defense, I, I did get less enthusiastic about Vincent Gray's performance because a lot of the his sticks on the edge were just kind of errors where they forgot to block him. And there were a couple incidents on their second touchdown drive where they did block him, and that went really badly. So, like – Dainty contact, gets shot six, f- eight yards downfield, blocks other guys from going and, and dealing with it. That's a major problem for him, yeah. and it's going to be something that he has to get fixed uh, now because Michigan's playing Army. So I don't know if we're going to see a whole lot of Vincent Gray this uh, week. You know, uh, might they go to a more traditional defense and use a, a Sam this week or use use Uche as a Sam because he, he does play there. I mean, I think you're going to see a lot of three-man lines. That's what I mean. So three, three f- more, a more of a 3-4-ish look with Uche and uh, Hudson? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I feel like you need to have mobility on the field. Uh, and uh, Army is going to try to option your guys and cut them, so you don't really need big guys. You just need agile guys who can dodge cut blocks and make tackles. So, M- and my recall is when teams were actually playing this offense in the s- in the early '70s, that most defenses were three fours. I mean, Michigan ran a three four against triple option. That was their that was their base deal. Usually, though, with a very small nose tackle, a two hundred pounder, and uh, and and bigger. On yeah, the, on what the they outside. would do is they. They would line up in a three-four, and they would slant to one side or the other. This is a different segment. Okay, stop sorry. dragging me into army talk. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh, 
<laughs> okay. What were we talking about? We're talking <laughs> about MTSU. Right. You, we skipped a piece on the uh, on the offense, and I, w- I wanted to know how far into a running back's career we go before we declare him free of the curse of Fred Jackson's beverages. Well, he's. I think he's got to go a year without getting hurt and clearly establish himself an upper tier Big Ten back. Okay. Obviously, Zach Charbonnet had pretty much the best possible start for a guy who only got like nine carries. I, that's been the, his history so far. Is that like pretty much best case scenario? Well, I mean, <laughs> from his recruitment I mean, on, you pretty much know with running backs pretty quickly about whether they're going to be a guy or not. Like, I don't think Kel- Kevin Grady was like people were like, oh yeah, I feel the same way about him as I felt about right. Charbonnet, especially on that forty-one yard run where he's displaying the, the whole package. Right, he's able to juke a guy out of his jock on the second level. He's able to run through some uh, arm tackles, and he has good uh, speed in the open field. Add on that with. The fact that he was designated the starter by Harbaugh, and Harbaugh's talking about him like he's already an NFL running back in terms of pass protection, and he 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 did <laughs> all he could do to prove it. He he did better in pass protection than True Wilson. And our season preview, we were banging the door, <laughs> we were banging yeah. the drum on True Wilson because he's a good pass protector, well, that, <laughs> which he is. <laughs> and that and that prediction is going to be my worst prediction of the year. But <laughs> not because of anything <laughs> about True Wilson, it's but because Zach Charbonnet is I, the uh, unicorn. I, I, it's I'm not used to this feeling of like a running back coming up and like never thought since Hart. Is no, it, is I mean something that, that was the pretty much the big question about the yeah. offense. That and the right tackle. Christian Turner incidentally had a good game too. Yeah, and I, I I like Christian Turner a lot. Like he's a guy who gets yards after contact. He's slippery. He's tough to bring down. He's able to tight walk the sideline, tight rope the sideline several times. Like, I think he's a dude, too. But back to Charbonnet, you know, my halftime tweets where I managed to get some reception and get some tweets out at halftime, I mentioned Charbonnet's pass protection. And in retrospect, how insane is that? A like true freshman in his first game. One of your takes from the <laughs> opening of the season is like, you know, that running back's pass protection really impressed me. <laughs> and it did. So, because he wasn't just <laughs> making the pickups. He was stoning guys. And that's... You haven't watched football with old men enough because that's definitely one of their favorite takes all the time. Okay. Yeah. Well, you I'll feel like you're a football guy if you're talking about the running back. I'll try not to change that behavior. I think it's more amazing that we had <laughs> an opportunity for a true freshman to get nine pe- nine pass pickups. Like, this was a passing offense all of a sudden. Well, they had something like 25 attempts at halftime, and Patterson's season average for last year was six. I mean, 26. <laughs> yeah. That's not Six quite. Six feels more more appropriate. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they clearly were going to be more balanced last than last year when they were spe- basically spent the entire season trying not to get Patterson hurt. And now you have McCaffrey. Now you have more confidence in your pass protection so you can open it up. And, and ye gods, we, we have to use these receivers. Like Well, the other play that from, from the offense that, like, if I could have scripted a play that I wanted to see better than anything else was four verts to McCune that Patterson hits him right per- – and, and McCune burls his way past the guy afterwards. I, and I think the the one he dropped was actually a, p- a good pass too. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it wasn't was really – good defensive Yeah, it wasn't too. necessarily a drop. It's yeah. just the, the defense got, got a win there. And, you know, bringing up four verts is, is a good thing to bring up because I don't think we've run that since I've been charting. Maybe back in Rich Rod's day sometimes, but like the aggressive field stretching, and especially safety stretching aspects of Michigan's offense. Like if you a lot of cover three and someone throws four verts at you, then that's what happens, right? So right. Like it's it's a thing that has been missing from Michigan's offense, and we had a lot of I don't know what you would even describe last year's pass offense as uh, trying to accomplish. But when you see four verts and you see the Collins post, you know what Michigan is trying to accomplish. They're trying to overload sections of the field. And whether that's everybody goes deep or everybody runs along one sideline, you know, people are going to get open. And it's more of a college scheme where you're expecting that there's going to be weak points and there's going to be people who pop open than what I thought uh, Hamilton was running last year. It was more of an NFL approach where, okay, this is the coverage look. You're going to go one side or the other based on the coverage look. And, you know, we're not going to pop anyone super open, but there's going to be opportunities for you to make a play even if the other team plays it perfectly. Right. It's it's <laughs> like a, it's like an Andrew Luck approach. Yeah, and, and, and you don't – Patterson's not Andrew Luck. You don't need to be prepared for ninjas if you're playing college football teams. Even Ohio State, you don't have to be prepared for ninjas. Right. So, like, you know, I, I thought the game plan I was really happy with, you know, 
the upside of the fact that I thought they missed a ton of opportunities to run the arc read is that that was the heart of their run game. And it worked really well last year, and it's not a thing where I think it's easy to like identify and be like, all right, here's how we're going to fix this. Because fundamentally, when you have a, ton, a running back, uh, a tight end running at you as a defensive end, you have to prepare to actually take out a block because if it's split zone and you just get blown out, well, we saw that happen a couple times. So, and I'm really looking forward to the stuff that McCune couldn't pull off last year. So, you know, the Michigan State game last year was pretty frustrating on, on tape because, like, they had a trap early. Mm -hmm. And the trap was basically McCune pulled across the formation like he was going to be running split zone or arc read. And then he's supposed to blow up a defensive tackle. So you're pulling linebackers out because they're like, okay, arc, arc, arc. And he just ran by the defensive tackle. And I was like, <laughs> that was so beautiful. <laughs> why? Why? And there were, there were a number of, of different events like that where – you could see what Michigan was trying to do. You could see that it was going to succeed, except for the fact that they had dumped an entire offense on a tight end midseason. And to see that they've kept that, they've built on it, and I thought the tight end blocking was very good in this game, that gives me a lot of positive feelings about not just Gaddis, but like the com the meshing of Gaddis and Warner. Right. Like I think that's going to be a real positive. Going back to the quarterbacks for a second, quarterbacking for a second. I mean, Patterson seems to be very accurate. I mean, uh, by and large, but the questions seem to be about decision making because there were a couple play, a yeah. couple times in this game where he had guys wide open and he threw to a guy who wasn't wide open, and I mean, is that? A fair comment? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's a fair comment. Like, I think that a lot of what felt bad about Patterson last year was his decision-making. Uh, first and foremost, his decision to leave the pocket a lot when he didn't necessarily need to. Um, something that I didn't see th in this game, which is nice. And with all the blitzing that MTSU was doing, to have Michigan be able to, like, not have someone dumped in his lap immediately – I think he, it's a matter of confidence, right? Like, we all know what happened to Devin Gardner. And he was never able to kind of get his head out of the idea that he was about to get crushed. And that's what happened. Understandably. Yeah, and that's what happened to Patterson <laughs> at Ole Miss. Yeah. It happened to him at the beginning of last year. And just getting comfortable with the idea that he can actually find someone in the pocket. Like, one of my complaints about his performance is there were a couple times where he just sat in the pocket too long. And – that's not good, but I'd much have much rather have that than a, a guy with happy feet because it also says good things about your offensive line that yeah, he has confidence that they're going to give him time. Mm -hmm. So, I, I I mean I think the main way that this offense isn't elite is if Patterson's decision making kind of stays at the 2018 level, but I also think that he's going to get better because I mean there are always transition costs in a new offense and he'll get more comfortable with it. Like the the four verts strike is nice because. You know, last year he had trouble interpreting what he should do when people just threw seven guys in a zone. Right. And that was seven guys in a zone, and he was like, yeah, I got this. I, well, I, well, I love off four verts, and this is – there are two things I love about it. First of all, what version of Gattis are we getting? Like, what offensive coordinator has he worked under that he is, has been his influence? Is it Moorhead, who we all adore, or is it, like, Franklin, who is, like – <laughs> I think we know the answer to that question. <laughs> I, uh, well, I think as soon as he run, he's going out there and bombing it, it's like, okay, sweet, we're, we're deep state. But also, like, four verts in the college sense, it's always going to get a guy singled up. At least one of your receivers is going to – there's no way to defend four verts with, ev with doubles on every single guy. So yeah, if I you get Nico Collins or you get Tariq Black or you get DPJ, if all those guys are out there and ru they're running verts plus a receiver – Exactly. Yeah. Whoever's just got one guy, toss it up to him, and that's a good play. I mean, you you can get that if you run, like, man free, and then your single up guys are just fades on the sideline, which you can get at any point. Right. But, you know, am I confident enough uh, with Nico Collins on a fade down the sideline? Yes. That was the only thing that really kind of got me about the approach there is that Collins – he has a couple of catches underneath. He has the touchdown in which it's not a great throw, but it just doesn't matter. And then he has the drop. <laughs> and then he's just kind of out of the game plan for a couple of quarters. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, my goal is to get Nico Collins 100 targets this season. <laughs> like, my goal, my personal goal. All right. And if I have to, like, yell at the television, 
hey, throw it to Nico Collins. That's his, I'm willing to go that far. Now, I, I don't think Collins had a drop last year. Is that true? Uh, I've he, read that. I don't know if it's the, true. The argument is whether he should have put his hands out to go for the one at Northwestern. He did not drop a ball that he tried to catch last year. Okay. Yeah. And, and the one in this game um, – was a hard catch. The ball was no. behind. I thought the ball was no, behind. No, him. no, it was. It was. It was, it was all right. It okay. was a straight up like a uh, drop. So it was a drop. But yeah. it's the first one of his career, and now he's matched uh, People Jones, who also has one, one routine year, drop yeah. in right. his career, which and that's that's good, right? That's like a, a really important aspect of the game that both these guys are still really good at. So receivers next year, Ronnie Bell, you were a little kinder to in UFR than I think I was yelling at the TV. Well, so, yeah, he, he had a couple of things go off his hands, but like, there, are you when you get you reach your hand out and it tips the end of your finger, are you supposed to catch that? No, like if you catch it, it's like the uh, Rashad Bateman catch in the Minnesota game where everybody's like, "Wow!" But if you drop it, it's like, "Oh, he hit he hit his hands. You got to catch that." Like, <laughs> no, that's not how <laughs> physics works. So I thought, you know, I thought he had a couple of issues, but just the fact that they're willing to target him so much. When they have Collins and they have Black, you know, and McCune, I think, is developing into a good receiver. Just the fact that he was so involved with the game plan, I think, speaks well to his ability and how he's going to be doing this year. Yeah. And then Cornelius Johnson. Well, he – Another I mean, best-case scenario freshman. Yeah, he had a couple – I mean, when I did his recruiting profile, I was like, this ranking is a joke. <laughs> like <laughs> His ranking was like low four-star. Well, he yeah, he was like – 150th or like 170th. Right, which is, I mean, that's like Manningham range. Well, Manningham was a top 100 guy. He was like okay. in the back half of the top 100. And that's where Cornelius Johnson should have been. So if you look at this guy's background, his his father is a historian, an author. His mother is a, is a doctor. You know, he went to an opening regional and put up like a 4-1 shuttle and a 4-5-40. And his vertical leap was insane. He goes to the opening, not the opening, he goes to his all-star game and kills it at the all-star game. He's running right past five-star Notre Dame safety commits, like, without even a problem. So you think his ceiling was just this guy's from Connecticut? Yeah, that's it. And they're, like, they're like, we can only put this guy up so hard, high because he's from Connecticut, even though they saw it right in front of their faces at an all-star game. So he and, and Molly Smith are the two guys who I was like, you know, these are the biggest misses recruiting-wise in terms of, like, the recruiting industry and getting it right. And I think we're seeing that with Cornelius Johnson already. Yeah, I his uh his his adjustment to the ball that was thrown behind him a was field of him actually. Yeah. You don't you don't really expect that ball at all. Yeah. So that's that's the other thing is like if you're missing on a hitch you're supposed to miss miss upfield not downfield. Right. Cuz those yeah, could be picked off or or broken up. So he had to be really on point to go bail out his quarterback there. So Good start. Yeah, I mean, both of his catches I thought were challenging. And yeah. uh, this is a freshman playing his first game, and he he looked like he belonged. Yeah, and that's another, like, what kind of preseason hype can you believe? Can you believe that the freshman wide receiver who's getting hype when he's playing next to DPJ, Collins, <laughs> Black, <laughs> Bell, and Sane are still is legit? Yes, you can believe that, because if he wasn't legit, nobody would talk about him. Right. So... I I am I'm, I'm I think we're going to be fine with uh next year on the wide receiver core. But uh, a couple more things on the defense and then we're going to take a break and come back and talk army. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh Ben Mason didn't really improve on a reviewing, just not ready. I think that was obvious just by watching him. He's he's a yeah. 275 pound there, there guy who used to be 240. There were a couple people like so often what I when I bring this stuff up it's cuz I've seen Twitter takes or takes on various websites right. to that effect. I didn't see an improvement. Is there. that who the bolded <laughs> alter ego is? It's 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 like the, Fre the amalgamation of Twitter. Yes, yeah, he's <laughs> frequently like the things that I've seen <laughs> about the game afterwards that I amalgamate into one very annoying bolded person. So it's not just like one Twitter account yeah. that doesn't know you're following him. That, that no, okay. it's it's definitely an amalgam. <laughs> um, and then Josh Uche needs to play. Yes, that was my takeaway. The Josh Jayuchi idea, idea. So we need the flag. Yes, we do need we need to we do need some sort of North Korea sh uh, shirt on the blog. <laughs> it doesn't quite <laughs> reference a player, <laughs> but I just I just need it on my body. Anyway, so he plays about forty percent of Michigan snaps in this game. He has a plus eleven point five. I don't think he had a single minus, and he did the right tackle dirty in all three ways that you can do the right tackle. So his first snap, he just goes right through him. 
Right. And and Bull Rush is the guy back in the quarterback. I will say, having reviewed MTSU, that was tapping to that guy all last year for on everybody. Fine. Yeah. So but <laughs> he goes right around him on the second snap, <laughs> and on the uh, third snap, he, he goes inside. By the end of the game, when they're doing a, a stunt between him and Hutchinson, three guys are blocking Josh Uche. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably a mistake, <laughs> but it might not be a mistake. It seems it, it seems logical. So the, the problem is going forward. Uh, how do you sort fit him in to this to this defense? Now I can see it in the Army game where you could play him at a, yeah. in a three four for sure. Uh, I mean, watch Army's defense; they do something like that all the time. Th so th this I uh, uh, that was part of my preview. Where I'm like, we should do, we should do this. Yeah. So I. First of all, he's out there on every passing down, clearly. And then even anything where it's like, is it second and seven? All right. I'm willing to, like, if they can run and put themselves in a, like, whatever. Second and seven is an Uche down. Second and ten is an Uche down. Second and five is an Uche down. Um, if you don't want to put him out there on first and ten, I kind of get that. But he can play defensive end. And maybe he's not going to be the greatest run defender in the world. But I feel like he's got upside there just because he is so explosive and he had a nice play in this game when they run power they ran power right at him and he took a tight end and he put him in the backfield so if you line him up across from the tight end on a standard down i think he can win against a tight end what you know what about the fact that right now i, I, I don't know what's going to happen with cheater and dwum for yeah. i mean we don't really know but we're thin at defensive tackle right now why not put hutchinson in the middle of the defense, use Pay and Dana, use Uche. They were, they were playing 280-pound guys or 275-pound guards this week. Well, so th th they actually, but, but they did that. Yeah, they so did. Yeah. At times they did it, and, and you play Glasgow with still at the will, and 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 you run a you run a th two inside linebackers, and you run a three-four. And yeah, I mean it's possible that that would get blown out just because Hutchinson isn't ready. I kind of feel like it would work well enough. Because one thing that Hutchinson immediately did upon arriving is he has the same kind of push-pull move that Winovich used a lot last year and also Ryan Glasgow. So that was Ryan Glasgow's go-to move, and he did it in this game on a quarterback draw where he took the center and just ripped past him yeah. instantly. So, like, that's a guy who I think would be able to survive as a three-tech. And, you know, Michigan, like I said, used to play 200-pound nose guards, 195-pound nose guards. I know, but it's just like – but it can't it do that anymore. This, this Why not? The guards were 250 pounds back then. Because like that's like 20 pounds lighter than Jordan Glasgow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you I know. I mean, you can't do that. No, like the version of that today is like offensive the, uh, linemen were 250 pounds, so it's a different there's, world. There's there's a version of that today, and it's like the 6'2", 280 defensive uh, def nose tag. Like, yeah. uh, with Ohio State's got a guy like that now, Bob I mean, Landers. Uh, well, I, you know, Hurst was kind of in the same vein, but you can't. So, realistically. I mean, you're hoping for Jeter to come back and come through. You're hoping yeah, for Dwumfer to get healthy. I mean, yeah, that'd be uh, great, but but like we in don't know. in the event where you're looking at, all right, am I going to put Ben Mason out there for significant snaps, or am I just going to slide Hutchinson inside and then get Uche, and on, then the get field. Uche on the field? I don't think there's any question. Like that's what I would do. That's what you would do. Right. That's what Seth would do. I'm not even going to ask Seth. I'm just going to say <laughs> <laughs> that that's what he would do. I've written about it already. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, I mean, th so that was one of the things that jumped out, and I thought Glasgow was, was excellent. Like, excellent not just on his sacks, but there was a, a run play that came to him that he identified and shot past his intended blocker like he'd been playing inside linebacker his whole career. Are there more Glasgow's by any chance? No. I asked that on um, you know, Thursday. There's, no. there's a, can there's, we like you there's know? There's a daughter, but she can't play football. <sighs> I mean, maybe she can. Can we go to like? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think she goes. Can to we Michigan. go to Glasgow, Scotland, and like just you know comb around there and see if there's anybody else who's well, we'll like see. who has long hair and wears hunting shirts? The nice thing is, is about 15, 18 years from now, there's three of them that are reproducing. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully. Get, yeah, on he, he, Get on that. Get on now. He he exceeded my expectations, and I was hoping that he would be, either he or McGrone would be the weak side linebacker, and he was he was very very good. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Dax Hill. There's a spot for him on this defense, and hopefully he takes it relatively soon, because yeah. the thing about the last two plays for Kelly Powell, yeah, they were actually not as bad for Kelly Powell as I thought live, but the the safety play on their touchdown was just like, yeah. yikes. Well, the Kelly Powell thing that made me more – the missing the the PBU okay, but 
He got dusted by he an did. MPSU guy. Yeah, and and yeah. He and got the, you put that with like the fade that they put on him against Wisconsin. And Wisconsin does not have fast receivers. No, it is it is definitely a it, it looks pretty. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of Brad Hawkins? Because I, I thought he played reasonably well. In the I game. think that's about the right take. Like mm. I thought he was very good coming down and tackling, which is a weird thing for it to be a strength because he's a converted wide receiver. Right. But I'm most comfortable with him when he gets the opportunity to make an open field tackle and he does a good job. Um, I think he was plus 7.5 and minus 6. That's so a lot of activity for a safety. That is a lot of activity for a safety. Um and then the interesting thing that they did with Hudson is they used him as a free yeah. safety pretty frequently. Uh, yeah, I was going to point that out. Like, I think that they liked Metellus and Hawkins better as their cover I guys. Mean, yeah, clearly. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I mean, we'll see how that goes. I think that if you have Uche on the field and you have Glasgow on the field, your necessity for having a guy like Hudson blitzing is a little bit less. So you can afford to have him back there as a free safety. And as we saw with Woods, I don't know if they'd be comfortable with anybody else except a hypothetically got his head straight, Jack Hill. Uh, Hill had, what, two snaps, one snap in the game? Do yeah, he was, he was a gunner on punts. He, okay, and, he and DJ Turner were the gunners on punts. And, yeah, he got in very, very late. And uh, actually, I, this, is, this is a good thing that you asked because I almost forgot one of the main takeaways, mm -hmm. is that Michigan looked a lot more diverse on defense. So they were doing things that they have not done under Don Brown where they'll show a look pre-snap and stem out of it just before the snap, which is Don Brown has done stuff where they show man coverage and then at the trap. But you're sort of limited in the things you can get away with there, so you can't really change the structure, so you're going to be one high. But Michigan was moving from press coverage to off coverage sometimes. And you know last year how the big thing that everybody talked about was like, all right, well, they move the safety to outside leverage. Right. So the, we're getting these slants instead of the slot fades. There was no consistent, all right, this guy's on the slot. I know that he's going to be playing outside leverage. I know that they're going to do some games. Yeah. The structure of the defense was not nearly as um, consistent and simplistic as it was. Now, was that an adjustment? Because MTSU was trying out. They, they just gave up on going inside entirely. Very possibly, like. So, like, if you're gonna if they're gonna attack your edges all the time, just go zone. Well, and you know, Michigan did this last year in the Notre Dame game. So Notre Dame started off by assuming that Michigan was running a lot of man coverage and going to be single high, and they had a bunch of plays that exploited that. First play against MTSU, Michigan goes man coverage. They have a flare screen where the linebacker trying to get on the back gets picked off. Right. It's a big game. And then Michigan immediately shifts to more of a cover two look. And I think that the so the um, the game context made it more likely that they were going to run their zone stuff. But it also just felt like, you know, the last year was a come to Jesus moment and, and Don Brown listened. And we're going to see a much more diverse defense going forward. And that's why I think Dax Hill is taking a little bit of time. Because, you know, he enrolls in the yeah, fall. Good point. It's he's too much to learn. And he's in the bridge program, so he's missing yeah. a lot of fall practice. And it's not just, okay, go out there and be a free safety. Go out there, play outside leverage on the slot. It's you got to be in this call, on this call. We might be moving from this one to this one. So that's a much tougher situation for a safety to come in and have an immediate impact than last year. So, yeah, I think he'll come along. And by midseason, he'll be in that. Nickel roll. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's, uh, I think, all we have to say about Middle Tennessee. So we're going to uh, have a commercial break, come back, and talk Army. Why do you do what you do? I grew up in the small town of Hazlitt, Michigan, and I witnessed great people I care about making a lot of poor financial decisions. I thought to myself, I never want to be in that position, putting my retirement at risk. Now we want to make sure that your retirement is not at risk. And by providing education and guidance, we inspire our clients to make great decisions, putting them on a path to be able to retire with confidence. I'm Nick Hopwood, CFP president and founder at Peak Wealth Management. And that's my why. Peak Wealth Management. Retire with confidence. The places you'll go may seem far from Ann Arbor. From San Francisco to St. Louis to Shanghai. But as members of the Alumni Association, we're never far. Because Michigan is more than a place. 
It's a mindset that connects us. For those who leave Michigan, but for whom Michigan never leaves, this is where you belong. The Alumni Association of the University of Michigan. Join today at umalumni.com. Let me just tell you a couple things to keep in your mind while you're out there. When we take the field, we're going to win. We've got big goals. We've got big ideas. We've got to win this game, and there is no game on the remainder of our schedule more important than the one you're going down to the tunnel to play today. Now let's go. Let's go. Underground Printing is proud to present The Bow Store. Visit us at our new location at 333 South Main or online at www.bow.team. In southeastern Michigan, the yearly cost for a nursing home averages $90,000. It doesn't have to, though. Reed McCarthy founded Ann Arbor Elder Law after handling a tricky situation for his own family. Years of experience later, his boutique firm works with clients across southeast Michigan dealing with Medicaid planning, long-term care, and tax, disability, and family law, not to mention family dynamics. If you have a family member who may need that level of care, or if you're ready to start your own estate plan, Reed can give you a plan for the future. Visit AnnArborElderLaw.com or call 734-945-9693. That's 734-945-9693. Want the perfect game day outfit? Underground Printing has unique, great-fitting UM apparel and officially licensed apparel from legendary Michigan names like Woodson, Howard, Schembechler, Eufer, and more. UGP also specializes in custom printed apparel and promotional items for groups, events, and businesses. Whether you need one shirt as a gift or 1,000 shirts for a charity walk, Underground can customize almost anything for groups large or small. To learn more, visit Underground Printing at one of our three convenient locations around Ann Arbor or online at undergroundshirts.com. Are you planning a business trip, a Michigan reunion, or a revenge tour in Ann Arbor and don't want to be stuck out by I-94? Look no further than the residents in Ann Arbor downtown. Positioned at the corner of Huron and Ashley, the hotel is just a block from Main Street and a short walk to Michigan Stadium and Central Campus with all the amenities you expect. Also, we podcast here most Sunday mornings, so if you let us know you're coming, we'll let you put a shout-out on the pod. That's the Residence Inn, Ann Arbor, downtown. Welcome back to MGO Radio 5.1, live from the Vo Store on Main Street. I'm Brian Cook. Greg Ross is here. Howdy. And Seth is also here. Am I saying my name again? Seth Fisher. <laughs> Seth Fisher. I Seth am Seth Fisher. Fisher. So Seth you got Fisher. something wrong last week. What? I got something wrong. You did. You were calling the, the, the black, the Perrin Black, an IPA. It's not, it's an ale. Oh, I looked okay. at the can afterwards. All right, and I was fine. Like, yep. Yes, you're Cause right. Because I was enjoying a, a nice black, yeah. and I was... Having my very smooth, my great flavor, pub ale, my parent black. Yeah. This is the parent segment, by the way. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, 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 I kind of got that vibe, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it, it is an ale, and it's fantastic. I said I was going to talk about a different one every single time, but I thought, like, this one We need a correction in there? Yeah. Well, what, yeah. Where can you find parent beers? It's actually at Meyer, Whole Foods, Kroger, starting next month. All right, no, starting now, yeah. And uh, any bar with a sense of taste, or you can check out the selection at parentbrewing.com. All right, so parent beer. Yeah, they provide us some more too. So we're gonna have a. I, I'll be walking around tomorrow with some parents during uh, during tailgate hour. All right, you and Pitfall will have a real good time. That's yes, that's what we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's on board. You finally figured out what Pitfall is. <laughs> yeah. Do you have did it you, explained did you, like, to you, look or it up? did you? I like had uh, Brian explained it. Uh, yes, he asked on WTK. Was yeah. it? Wha- was the commercial only like on streaming services, or was it? No, it was. It was ubiquitous in 2012. It was like the thing that they did before Larry Culpepper. I was. I know. Well, I was a streamer at the time, so like every commercial was let's have a real good time. Oh, yeah. Literally oh. every commercial. They would just play it, and then they'd play it again, and you might get a car commercial, and then yeah. they, they'd go back to the Dr. Pepper one. Yeah. I mean, it felt <laughs> like that watching it on, like, television as well. It just <laughs> you could it not get away could, from, and it, from and Pitbull. And, you know, but I was more annoyed by it. I didn't, like, you know, convert to, like, you know. You know, I think, I think everybody <laughs> was. And then we had this, like, <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome. And then you, you, you start thinking about it, and it's just like, oh, they're going to – have a Dr. Pepper party under an overpass. I, I, I <laughs> thought this was all ironic. It was ironic. <laughs> and, and then 
Like it, now that now that there's a Mr. Worldwide in the UFRs, like well, so it was ironic, and then they had a contest where it was like, oh, do you want Pitbull to come to your Walmart? Well, you got to vote online, <laughs> and online saw this and they were like, oh my god, this is amazing, <laughs> and they all voted for him to go to Kodiak, Alaska. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the 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 far the like the and he went. Yeah, and he went, oh. and there was like these pictures of him there, and he's like hanging out with some some Inuits and. He's look. Li- he looks like he's having a great time. And you know, when they asked him about it, he was like, "Yeah, it was cool. I got to go to Kodiak, Alaska. I would never have done that otherwise." And I was like, "This guy has a philosophy for living." <laughs> and then, so it's not ironic. <laughs> not anymore. Wow. And then he had like this uh, New Year's Eve rock and Eve kind of thing, where he's he's emceeing like this party in, uh, you know, Miami. And he's got like salt and pepper out there, and like Coolio, and like Busta Rhymes, and I'm like, all right, this is what I wanted. I didn't want Three Doors Down or like the latest Pop Shantus. I wanted old school hip hop New Year's Eve, and I'm like, I'm in. Pitbull's my fave, and I don't like listen to his music, but he's still my fave. All right, okay. I follow my I, Twitter. I, I get it now. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> and he's he's got he just says what does he say Dale. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I've just seen it. You're, you've gone further down Dale. the pitbull thing. It just says I, he's just like Dale, but I think he's got an accent. I, so I mean, he's Dale. talked about consistently in our yeah. or constantly in our Slack chat, and I'm usually not part of those conversations. Like, and then I appreciate it from afar. And then Smoothatron uh, Abraham, our, one of our uh, Photoshop experts, was like, "I remember when I made this four years ago," <laughs> and I was like, "I do," and I didn't have an idea for the banner this year, so I was like, "Let's do it." <laughs> And uh, so we need to change the energy around Michigan football. You know, it's all this like depression and keep losing to Ohio State. And we got murder wolves and all that. No more murder this year. We're going to be. I like, I like murder wolf. Yeah, we're I like murder wolf, wolf too, but we're changing the, we're changing the vibe. All right, all right. We're going to be like, we're going to be positive. We're going to be, we're going to go to Kodiak, Alaska, and it's going to be cool. If you ask murder wolf would party under an overpass. And no, no, he would he would like leave bodies under an overpass. <laughs> so we're going to go from like <laughs> like let's murder everybody and put them under an overpass to like, why don't we get some Dr Pepper and have a real good time? This is not about Army, but that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> Army's not going to be a real good time. Do you want to so, talk about Army? Or yeah. <laughs> well, my favorite thing about putting up the Pitbull banner <laughs> is that there were people who were like legitimately angry about it. They were like, this is this is bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they be angry? I, I was mystified. Pe- I wasn't people, angry. People just get angry about something. They're like, I got to put up some people involved with the program. And I'm like, we've been doing that for 15 years. And have we been? Ha- hasn't State? helped. Right? Hasn't helped. So we're changing the energy around the program. <laughs> sure. Whole new energy. We're going to have a real good time. Exactly. Oh, anyway, Army. Ar- is not going to be a real good time. No. It is going to be a slog. We make it nine possessions. Oklahoma had seven. So Oklahoma was the eighty fourth S and P defense. Michigan, like the worst projections, put them in like the twenty range or twenty five, yeah. and like that was the problem. Oklahoma could just get rolled, so they gave up. They they had seven possessions, or they had eight possessions or seven possessions. I think they scored on almost all all of them. No, that was fourteen fourteen going into overtime. Okay, but they they fine. They moved the ball effectively. They I, did. I don't they did have two. They had yeah. drives of 19, 17, 16, and 16 plays. And I don't know how they didn't score on the other two drives. Right. But they must have <laughs> missed a field goal or gone for it on fourth down. And to me, that's the most terrifying, like, slash annoying, slash uh, I have to give Todd Monk and his, like, dap. Because <laughs> they go for it on fourth down on any half reasonable. And they've built their whole program around the fact that, you know, it's really tough to stop a triple option offense. I'm going 10 yards in four plays. Yeah, but if an offense gives up on going more than three yards, and like, because off because defenses are like, hey, you want three yards, I'll give you three yards. Right. And they're like, you can do that every time. Right. And, but I, and there's no good way to design a defense. I know people have tried. Like they, they try against each other all the time. But there's no good way to design a defense to stop them from getting those three yards. Like if you could give them negative two yards and eight yards every once in a while, like that would be a good trade off, right? Yeah. But, no. I mean, if you get them in third and 12, it's over. So, yeah, uh, and if they get you in fourth and one, it's pretty much over, too. So they yeah. converted 
86% of their fourth down out. 31 of 36, and I think 21 of 23 from a yard. Rice did stop them once. Well, and, and Rice, incidentally, is terrible. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, Rice is terrible, and they only ran, or they only gained 280 yards. Their, their Rice. one good player is a defensive tackle. Well, though. Two, 280 yards has to be taken in the uh, context, right? Of so, the like pace of the game. Right, yeah. So, like, that, that might have been a 400 yard game if you got to play X number of possessions. Instead of how so you really that. think this is going to be that sort of a slugging, uh, sludgy? They they are built game. for upsets. The uh, the entire idea yeah. of this team is, but they need to get lucky, right? Like yeah. eventually, Michigan's going to pick the right gaps and put them as soon as you got them in second and twelve, drives over. Well, uh, I think it's more about Michigan's offense. So Michigan's offense should score on every drive in this game, except you know you go back to that Middle Tennessee game and you, what do you do on the first play? You fumble. Yeah, but you have a eighteen yard gain and you fumble. Right, and you have like a slant to Collins that'll that'll move the sticks and you just drop it. Right. Like the problem with Army is okay, you have a couple of those in the middle Tennessee game, you get over it, you score your forty points. Against Army, that's like a quarter of your possessions in that game. So if you make two errors, you can get into halftime and it's gonna be seven seven or fourteen ten or whatever. And that's just a situation where it's early in the season. You got a new system. You had some hiccups in the previous game. It's not that hard to see Michigan in a really uncomfortable position for half of this game, for three quarters of this game. Now, I don't think that you know the spread is particularly off, which is Michigan by 22. But there's a strong possibility for like nervousness. I mean, the last two games against Air Force, it's been the same way, right? And Air Force is not nearly the, like, soul-killing, Ishtar-marching, <laughs> like, fourth-down so mavens But the difference with Air Force, my, my impression was that we, the Air Force game was sort of taken for granted, and it was just sort of a game. And, where, and this game, I don't think, has been taken for granted. I think they, you know, they understand that this is a team they had to prepare for. They've prepared for them since January. I believe yeah, that's like true. The coaches have been talking about this game in particular. Well, they hired Georgia Tech's defensive yes, coordinator. Right, yes, as yeah. an <laughs> analyst, right. So, I mean, I think this has been on the radar in a very real way for Which is a lot months. of resources to put towards one game that you right. could have just played up directional Michigan school yeah. instead. Which would have been smarter, yes. but, but that's not where we're at. I mean, Well, and, and so – to go back two years to the Air Force game then, and what does Michigan do with Kalik Hudson? They use him as like sort of a super deep middle linebacker to go sideline to sideline in a, a scheme that I haven't seen before. I'm sure that a lot of teams that deal with option, especially on like the lower levels, have. But to me, that was a pretty good defensive game plan from Don Brown. And still there's this kind of moment in the in the second quarter where they're doing this thing where they line up their – two wide receivers as like bonus tight ends to one side and Michigan just doesn't have the number of people out there they need to deal with it and they're going down the field and they're just racking up first downs and I'm like oh, this feels terrible and then they just stop doing it like <laughs> Michigan didn't fix it <laughs> Air Force just stopped doing it and like I, it's a, a, a situation where it's like Bane right where you know you're Batman, and like, you think the darkness <laughs> is your alley? Well, I was born in the darkness. <laughs> this is my Bane impression, everybody. Um, and, and so no matter how well you prepare for Army's triple option, they've seen it before, right? And they have responses to it. And that, like, Michigan has much more talent on both sides of the ball, and they're probably going to win this game. But when Army's on offense, it's not going to feel good. And Michigan is not going to be able to, like, significantly – like they're not going to be significantly better than Colgate because it's just a, it's a different world. Well, or Rice for that matter. I mean, or before rice. the <laughs> season, I mean, was, uh, I think on on WTKA, I was asked about what game bothers me that maybe shouldn't, and I was right away said Army because that's I was that the game I thought was going to be a hard one for us. But after last week, I'm not so sure. You know, Rice is dreadful. That's a dreadful football yeah. team. I mean, they've won uh, three games in two years, and they were against Prairie View A&M. And, and their quarterback is probably the worst in the right. country. Right, and year. so I just don't, you know, 
it's hard for me to believe from week one to week two that Army's going to be that much better with an offense that isn't probably going to change all that much, and the defense is probably going to get well overmatched. And so I, I'm not feeling quite as – yeah, I have mean, quite as much angst uh, as you do about this. But one. the thing about Army is that they're going to put up 14 points against – the Pittsburgh Ever, anybody, Steelers, yeah. right? Like, there's, it's just what they do. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I think if Michigan comes out and they're crisp in this game, they get up to a two-touchdown lead and then it's just over. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if we get one of those games that every team experiences where you're just – Looks right, like you, you got up on the wrong side of the bed. You put the ball on the ground. You do yeah. some stupid stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's I, I mean that's what it is. And Michigan put the ball on the ground four times in the last game. A- so. Actually, they, it was they didn't count the one on the uh, extra point, so it was really five. But that's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah their their defense is. Uh, I I love that. I'm not going to get into the design of the defense on the podcast, but I love the design of their defense. I really want to steal it for Michigan against spread teams. It it feels like a, a Josh Uche and yeah, Andy and they Hutchinson use two defense. defensive ends yeah. that are kind of like our defensive ends. Like they're good good guys at like taking on double blocks if they they're need to. But they're the same size. Yeah, I don't know if. The so the thing is, is that they're gonna blitz a lot because they're undersized, and when they're not blitzing, they're just gonna like tackle basically. <laughs> like you know, if they you're, they're gonna play a lot of off coverage, and there's gonna be situations where. You know, Michigan just gets 15 yards because Army doesn't want to give up a touchdown. So the thing that Michigan kind of has to watch out for is when they shift mm-hmm. and, like, do stuff right before the snap. So the Kyler Murray interception against Oklahoma uh, in the Oklahoma game, which was one of the main reasons that that actually got to overtime, it's just a post route. And Kyler Murray has his guy – and he's like, all right, man coverage, and then there's no safety. He's like, all right, I'm going to throw this. <laughs> Except the guy bailed out pre-snap, and he's actually running the route, so he just throws the post route directly to the safety because <laughs> he decided that, I mean, that, that was just the plan, right? And so you have to, l- you can't make pre-snap reads and expect them to be good post-snap, which I think, you know, Patterson did a couple times against Middle Tennessee, specifically yeah, and the, the black throw where he's triple yeah. covered. And they're designed to... They're they're designed like to be anti RPO, and like they're gonna pu- they're they're pulling a lot of weight off the field in order to do that. Yeah. So like this is not a team that you can just kind of like just go out there and run your RPO offense against. They are are a team that you can just kind of bash out of the way. I really like their two linebackers. Um, I actually like the the weak side linebacker who's more what we would think of as like a thumping middle linebacker. Okay. I, I liked him better than Cole Christensen, who's the one who's like the cover boy that everyone the captain, the one who racks up tackles and everyone knows. But the other guy is just like a very squat, loves to run into your blocker and bash your blocker backwards. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could have been the, who he was playing against, but he's going to be annoying at times. But I think that if Michigan wants to just – Michigan could salt this game away too. I just know that we don't want to. They want – you know, you don't want to play Army's game. But Army's defense is built to just kind of like bash them away. They don't have very much on the defensive line. Yeah. All right, we're going to take one more break, come back, and uh, wrap it up. If you find yourself on the wrong side of the law in Ann Arbor or around Metro Detroit, you want a Michigan man in the huddle. Call former prosecutor and now criminal defense attorney Jonathan Paul at 248-924-9458 or visit his website, michiganlawgrad.com. Is your online store sluggish, outdated, underperforming? You may be suffering from chronic crappy website disorder. One in three online stores built by your brother's friend's nephew currently suffers from chronic crappy website. But now, there's hope. Introducing Human Element. Huel has helped hundreds suffering from CCW to turn their online stores around, creating fast, secure, and engaging online experiences that turn visitors into customers and put products back at the top of their search engine game. Before Huel, I had abandoned carts, browser errors, and poorly animated GIFs. Now, with Huel, I can focus on what I'm actually good at. Running my business. Jeffrey, would you be a deer and pull the Ferrari around? Side effects may include increased traffic, customer conversions, better ROI, compliments, elation, 
and early retirement. Why live with the disappointment of chronic crappy website disorder? Speak to your human element consultant today to see if Huel is right for you. So by now I'm sure you've heard about HomeShare Lending and my friend Matt Demarest. I'm going to tell you once again, if you are buying or refinancing a house, this is who you got to call. Everyone who's used him so far from our site has said the same thing. And, you know, my experience itself, it, we just bought a house just a couple of years earlier before we refinanced. Um, and so we got to, like, see one-to-one -one comparison between the bank that we worked with and working with Matt. And it was just a completely different experience. He really knows the industry well. He knows uh, what you need to provide him so you don't have to keep on going back and forth all the time. He can shop with different lenders so he can get you a priority with them. And like I said, everyone who's worked with him has gotten the same feedback. So if you are looking to buy or refinance your house, please go to homesurelending.com slash mgoblog and Matt will set you up. That's Home Sure Lending, NMLS number 1161358. The places you'll go may seem far from Ann Arbor, from San Francisco to St. Louis to Shanghai. But as members of the Alumni Association, we're never far because Michigan is more than a place. It's a mindset that connects us. For those who leave Michigan, but for whom Michigan never leaves, this is where you belong. The Alumni Association of the University of Michigan. Join today at umalumni.com. Welcome back to MGO Radio 5.1, live from the Bow Store on Main Street. Who's our uh, musical artist this week? I, I used Duke Shirell again because he kept uh, on sending me more. Sure, yeah. He was, yeah, as long as I've got, you know, Parliament Funkadelic texting me, I'm going to keep this going <laughs> as long as possible. <laughs> so uh, Craig has abandoned us, which is, I was going to get a prediction from him. Do you have a prediction? F against Army? Yeah. 24-7. Uh, 24 24 so what did I say? I said 32 13. Yeah. I couldn't get a weird enough score for Army because it's just like, you know. I, th I think a, a 14 7 would be like a weird score against these guys. That's actually true. But uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying not to complain about it, but it's just like, why, 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 why are we playing this? I heard it was Harbaugh who picked it. Yeah, that would make sense because Harbaugh just does stuff and people are like, oh, I don't know about that. And he's like, we're doing it. I, I love the troops. D d how dare you take away I, my my movie about the the sniper? Now I'm going to play army. Honestly, I think that uh, <laughs> I just, that's not that's not. It, could, <laughs> it actually could be why. <laughs> I I'm like I'm trying to compute like and like that could definitely be a Harbaugh <laughs> thought process, couldn't it? I think he might be like, oh, we got a losing record against this team. We got to fix that. Yeah, uh, got to yeah. get get to five hundred against the uh, Black Knights. Because everyone's talking about that. Everyone, uh, everyone always talks about how we have a losing record against Army and nobody else that so we've played eight times. I'm. This is me being sarcastic. Well, you you just had like a whole segment with Dooley about like, hey, everybody already knows this but stuff I'm that happened in nineteen forty five. I'm aware of the fact that not everybody's into that. That's why we have a podcast that's separate for it, which is I see got bonkers numbers by the way. So. Bonkers numbers? Yeah. Double Yace podcast. Sorry, Ace. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a dick. I don't know, I'm sorry. Also, it's like off you, know, you know I love Ace. It's it's, 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 you know uh, I, I try hard for it's that. It's off-season. Oh, no, I know. And, and, and it's Ace talking to himself as opposed to like Sap and I like no, getting no, out no, the famous no, person no, on no, there. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not, I'm not really All making right. a comparison. That's me being sarcastic. Do you not know my humor? I I don't. <laughs> no, it's sometimes I hard. I I adore Ace, and I I'm the All first right. to listen to the Ace Pods. So good. Yeah, <laughs> more people should. <laughs> Is this? Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's about that time. I think. I think that was that was a good. We need to end that this was podcast no, immediately. You don't want to do a gimmicky segue. top five or anything here. No, we could it's just <laughs> we've been doing this for an hour and a half. How I'm much more can the people take? I don't know. I think the people want to know more about Army. They just want to experience this game. Well, they don't get any more about Army, but I'll tell you something about Pitbull. Yeah. Actually, I use a lot of Pitbull facts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any more. You he's need, got a, he's you got need a new like single out. You need a few out. seconds more of uh, a Pitbull fact. He's got, he's you got, follow him on Twitter. Yeah, he's, nothing else he's got he a single out. Check it out if you like music that I don't really like. 